Hello and welcome to this global politics video interview on the privatization of warfare. My name is David Van Royen and sitting next to me is Dr. Pietro Maffetoni, who is a lecturer of global politics here at the University of Durham. Our guest today is Dr. James Patterson, who is a senior lecturer of politics at the University of Manchester. Dr. Patterson, welcome to Durham and welcome to global politics. Thank you for inviting me. Now, we're going to be talking about the privatization of war and more specifically the ethical aspects of private war. Yeah. Before we go on to talk about that, could you briefly give us some sort of conceptual analysis of what, first of all, private war means, mm -hmm. but also who's involved in private war, the private security contractors, what, who are they, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah, I'm more, more than happy to. So, so the focus of my work isn't private war per se, because that involves lots of different non-state actors, but a particular form of non-state actor, which is private military security companies. So private military security companies um, have increasingly become prevalent in the international system so over the past few decades and so what they do various different roles um, much of the focus in the media and international attention has been in terms of um, the armed security sector so in Iraq and Afghanistan armed contractors providing protection services but that's just one small part of the industry the industry is also does logistical services such as some of the quite more menial tasks involved in supporting supporting the regular armies in the in in, in, in conflict zones and also training uh, various other various other services as well okay um, I heard a statistic that in the f during the first Gulf War there are a hundred soldiers to every one private contractor yeah in 2008 in the second Gulf War um, the ratio had equalized at one to one yeah why has there been such a dramatic increase of private contractors? Yeah, I'd actually say that the, ra the ratio is even greater than that in Afghanistan. So there'd be more private contractors in Afghanistan um, at, at certain points than there were than there were regular soldiers. Um, so it's even gone beyond one, one for one. Um, uh, just to kind of elaborate a bit more, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of private contractors. So why has there been that move? So I think there are two main reasons for the push for increased privatization. And the first is just this is part of the general neoliberal trend that we've got where there's been privatization, the belief in neoliberal politics, um, privatization of other areas, so education, health, utility services. The next logical step was military services. So it's part of this neoliberal belief that private companies can and should be doing this on the neoliberal view. So that's more kind of the economic side, on the or ideological side, I should say. On the there's also a political element to it. So it's viewed by certain governments that this is something that politically reduces the costs of going to war um, in terms of the domestic pressures that they face. So private contractors don't necessarily receive the same amount of media attention when they're killed in conflict, killed in conflict zones as, as do regular soldiers. Um, also, there's a perception, although I don't necessarily agree with this perception <laughs> that, for, that it saves money so the, uh, the suggestion is that it saves money because you're only when you're hiring PMSCs private military security companies you only need to actually employ them when you're fighting war you don't need to employ them uh, employ them when you're at peace by contrast with the regular military you need to pay them throughout the whole Forever, you know, on, ongoing, you need to you need to pay them. So there's so that's another. Th th there is that perception. I don't necessarily believe that they are cost effective, but there is that perception, at least in the short term, that it saves money, and this relates into political pressure. Then for political decision makers who are under pressure to cut budgets, limited budgets, they, well, this is one way that you could potentially save money. Yeah. So if you can uh, jump in, um, I guess that um, we're here to talk about um, um, the ethical aspects of um, the use of private military contractors. And I, I guess, uh, from your introduction, one of the first themes that one could pick up was is, um, is there a sense in which uh, the use of private military contractors makes um, international conflict more likely? If the costs to um, uh, s governments, uh, the costs of war in terms of, you know, um, Publicity, but also perhaps economically. Although you said, you know, certain you yeah, buy into yeah. the economic argument. Um, but if the costs are reduced, um, is this um, a, an incentive or at least a way of making conflict easier, in a sense? Um, in short, yes. So <laughs> yeah, yes. So um, 
I, yeah, so one of the main actual ethical issues I think relates to this, this issue that it increases the likelihood of conflict in the international system. So I, I'll say a little bit more. So I think there are various ways that it increases conflict um, in terms of, first of all, the number, the, the times that there are, what would actually be the resort to force in the first place. And secondly, when there is the resort to force, the, um, the horrors of the war, if you like. So the degree of force that's actually involved, I think, can be exacerbated. So I think some of the formal constraints on war that we find in international law can be circumvented and bypassed by using private military and security companies. Second, I think that um, some of the informal constraints that we have, so some of the, the norms that we have in international society about the fact that you shouldn't be resorting force that aren't, don't quite meet the standards of international law can also be resort, uh, can also be bypassed. So those, those, those are two quick concerns, but more generally in terms of international instability, this kind of relates to to your objection, to your consideration about um, about democracies and the fact that you can bypass, that they can use these ways more, more more easily because of costs. Yeah, that's a certain consideration. But there's also other ways that it loosens the fact that loosens the constraints on not going to war. So governments can use private military and security companies to not simply because of the economic costs, but for political costs to go to war more easily. Um, I also think that there are issues with. Uh, non-state actors hiring private military and security companies themselves, um, such as major transnational companies, which can potentially increases the likelihood of conflict. So you you, you get this in um, uh, certain areas that are rich in rich in resources. So this is another issue where there might be increased international instability. Now it might not necessarily be more wars per se, but um, my point is international conflict. So the worry mm, is that mm. by increasing the amount of arms, um, the increasing amount of people that are providing protection services, there's a real worry that it's going to be increased I increased international stability. Your position on private contractors is based quite heavily on just war theory. Yeah. What specific elements of just war theory do you draw upon? I heard, um, I read one of your papers. You focus quite a lot on, on the effectiveness of the military. Yeah. Um, is that the most important factor of just war theory for you? Um, to some extent, yeah. So, I'd, so um, I've developed my, I should say, I've developed these papers into a, into a book that's, um, I try and flesh out my ideas in terms of just war theory a bit more so systematically in relation to private military security companies. So I don't think there's any one particular part of just war theory that's necessarily that much more important than any others. I would view just war theory as, Making a series of necessary conditions that anyone has to anyone has to meet, and also um, some desirable conditions that can improve the moral justifiability of certain actions. Um, now, in terms of private military and security companies, something that I think it highlights in terms of just war theory that's often not looked into, which is what I call the, lit the the issue of the moral legitimacy of the military. So, when we're fighting a just war, we are. Um, when we're thinking about just war theory, there's often not really a consideration of which military is actually that's doing the fighting. So we tend to think, does the war meet standard Yusabellum criteria? So has it got, um, these, has it, does, is the war just in terms of its cause? Is it the last resort? Has it got a reasonable prospect of success? Um, has it got legitimate authority? Uh, is it going to be proportionate? So on and so forth. Now, one thing that's not considered then is actually who's doing the fighting itself and so you might think that actually in certain times this is a really relevant consideration to whether it's going to be permissible to resort to force so you might think for instance that the war in Vietnam was problematic not simply because it failed to meet a lot of those standard just war criteria but because it was a conscript force where the conscription was highly problematic and the people the, the conscripts didn't have a choice whether to fight or not now, I think private military and security companies also highlight this issue of the moral legitimacy of the military. So we need to think about, in terms of just war theory, the fact that there are a whole host of issues related to private military and security companies that would be missed on standard accounts of just war theory that tend to just focus on the, the, these criteria. So issues to do with the fact that contractors uh, might not have um, duties of care respected from their employers or the fact that um, contractors might not necessarily be um, 
uh, the, the private munitions security companies, the, the, the way that they organize force might not be as representative as, say, all volunteer force or a conscripted army. So there are various issues, I think, that push us to think more about the moral legitimacy of the military system as much as war theory. Um, I guess one way to, to um, um, push this forward is, is uh, and the, the next uh, important question is, uh, one of the main ethical aspects uh, is related, I guess, to the uh, the kind of motives that yeah. uh, those who are members of um, um, those who are uh, private military contractors uh, bring uh, to the dimension of of conflict. And I was wondering whether there is a sense in which uh, uh, the type of motives that we are likely to find uh, um, among those who uh, participate in, in, in uh, the privatization of war, and especially those who work as uh, private military contractors, to some extent uh, disqualify their, uh, their role uh, within um, a um, armed conflict. Uh. Yeah, so th I think this is one of the central objections to private military security companies, and it's the idea that if someone is motivated by financial gain, this means that they shouldn't be participating in war. You find this in a lot of the discussions in the literature on private insurance security companies, but also in more generally in the um, in the public debate on whether there should be private insurance security companies. Now, I think that actually the argument does have some force. So, I think that in general, individuals should be motivated by good reasons just per se for doing things that should be motivated by other concern and not simply by their own self-interest, to some degree at least. I also think that in warfare this is important. So when you're thinking in war, private ministry security companies, if you're a contractor, you should be motivated by other regarding reasons and not simply your own self-interest. And then I think it's an empirical matter that private ministry security contractors are more likely to be motivated by the wrong sorts of reasons. So self-interest, financial gain in particular, than regular contracts, uh, than regular soldiers. Although I'd like to caveat that and say that I accept that private contractors are gonna have a variety of different motivations for becoming private contractors. And so they might, they might become a private contractor because they are, they want to, um, they w they've been in the regular military, they've retired and they want to continue to do something like they're doing or they might even have family pressures or they might actually see that being a private contractor is is a way of um, being patriotic and helping their state out. So there are a whole variety of reasons why you might become a contractor. My, my, my claim is simply the more limited one that it's more likely to think that private military and security companies, uh, contractors are going to be motivated by financial gain than, than regular soldiers. And this is simply because of the high wages on offer. They seem to provide a major incentive to, for individuals to become private contractors when they're regular soldiers. What would be a typical uh, wage, just to give a sense of you know, the practical um, aspect? It's very difficult to answer that because there are, the so, role, yeah. there are so many different roles um, and it depends on whether you're a US and American former specialist, um, specialist regular military soldier or whether you're um, a third country national as they're called or a local national, the, the terms that you use for so um, if you're f not from, if you're from a different state, so if you're from Uganda or Fiji or wherever, um, or if you're from a, l a local national, so say if you're from Iraq or Afghanistan, and if you're hired, your wages are likely to be a lot, lot lower, and people like to do more menial tasks. But still, generally, even then, the wages are often higher. Comparatively, comparatively yes. Yeah. People who endorse private contractors would point to examples such as Sierra Leone, which um, seem to be quite a successful um, operation to do with private contractors. I think it was Executive Outcomes, a South African private military security company. Yeah. I think they sent about 150 people to Sierra Leone and managed to move the RUF rebel group away from the diamond fields yes, and yeah. broker a peace deal between the rebels and the government. Mm. W what would your response be to that? Was it because they were private contractors or would it have happened with all volunteer forces as well? So in that particular case, um, it, it, it was unlikely that anything else would have happened. So, uh, so, my, what, so one of the themes of my book is that actually in certain cases, it can be all things considered morally permissible to hire private military security companies. And so part of my thinking when developing this theme was cases such as Sierra Leone. The details of the Sierra Leone cases are, are disputed in the literature, so I don't want to make too much, too much of that. But 
you can think more generally hypothetically. So what if there was a, a major humanitarian crisis? Thousands of people dying. The regular military in the state isn't really able to do anything or is potentially even involved in the violations of the human rights. The international community, for whatever reason, doesn't want to send peacekeepers, doesn't want to intervene, so NATO doesn't want to intervene. Would it then be potentially permissible to hire a private military security company to assist the regular military to do something, as in the case of Sierra Leone, or even potentially intervene by itself? The latter, the latter is probably quite unlikely at the moment, but the former is certainly conceivable. Now, I think that it could be all things considered permissible because the consequences of doing so would be in that particular case in terms of the improving the situation on the ground, stopping mass killing in short, would outweigh all of the other moral problems that the use of private military security companies poses in general. So I don't want to be an absolutist about this. I think that there can be cases where it can be all things considered permissible, although I think those are probably quite rare. Um, yeah, so just to uh, provide some sort of uh, devil's advocate here, I mean, uh, one objection to uh, the use of private military contra um, contractors is, is that, uh, I mean, many people would say that the use of force is something that we tend to associate uh, for normative reasons uh, to the state. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense in which the very status of a private military contractor um, um, is possibly uh, justifiable uh, from a normative uh, point of view? Is there not some sort of oxymoron between private and military contractor, one could say? Yeah, so that argument is sometimes pushed in, in, in the various literature and the discussions around this, and I don't really buy it. So I think it is poten potentially legitimate to be a private contractor if you do absolutely everything right. And so um, my thought is that the state can potentially legitimately authorise private actors to do certain things. Or individuals on an individual basis might be able to sometimes legitimately authorize other individuals. So, say if I was giving a hypothetical example, say if I was walking down the street um, and I was likely to be attacked. Now, and I could I could hire uh, David to help me, <laughs> uh, as a private contractor to, to to help look after me. Now, I think that I would have the right to be able to hire David on an individual basis at least. Um, to protect myself. So you could think of sim something similar in terms of private contractors, that if you are under a threat, you, you have the right potentially to, to hire a private actor, to pay your private actor to protect your own basic interests. Now, there are various issues when it comes to the international system and, and thinking about states more generally, whether actually you want to go down that line. Because if you're actually allowing these individuals that right, then there might be unintended consequences where there will be abuses um, and it can hold it lead to a whole host of problems. So my thought is that we probably want to try and limit that right, but in principle at least, it's potentially it, it, it'd be potentially acceptable. And I don't think that the reasons for limiting that right will rule out all potential cases. And so back to the Islerian case, I think that it might think might be all things all things considered permissible in exceptional cases still to hire, hire private military security companies. One could say a practice that is uh, not intrinsically uh, uh, wrong, although it may be in uh, many uh, or most circumstances very problematic in a way and not yeah. justifiable. Yeah, so I, I, I hesitate to use the word intrinsically. I think that it depends exactly what you mean by intrinsically <laughs> and there's various, there's various discussions of that. So my view is that there are what I call deeper problems in the fact that even if there were effective systems of regulation, there would still be several problems raised by the use of private military security companies. And you might call that intrinsic, you might not. Um, now, my view is that those reasons, deep intrinsic, whatever you'd like to call them, are weighty, but not of absolute weight. And sometimes the consequences of the situation at hand won't completely will outweigh those other various considerations and that's what that's what means that that's what makes it permissible to intervene such as in cases the hypothetical Sierra Leone case. I've got one final question for you and it might sound cliched as a final question but what do you think um, will be the the future of private contractors are we going to see an increase or 
is public opinion going to cause a move back to all volunteer forces? Yeah, so um, I'm s so I've just written and finished a book that says that we should try and eschew private munitions security in companies and we should try and move away from the private security munitions industry. But I'm sceptical that that's going to happen, at least in the short term. So my 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 view is that actually there's going to be increased privatisation. So the UK and US, they've already privatised a significant amount of part of the military, and I think there's struggles. There's not that much more that can be privatised without privatising the frontline services, which is not really a major major move forward. Where there will be a lot more movement, I think, is in terms of firstly, private actors hiring private military security companies, so transnational companies. I think that's much more likely to happen in the future, but also non-Western states increasingly developing their own market for force. So Russia have intimated that this is something that they're interested in because it can actually make it easier for them to f pursue their own um, their own foreign policy agenda without some of the blatancy. Um, anyway, this is a report that I've heard. Anyway. Uh, similar intimations, I think for there was a report where it suggested that France had actually something similar, made some sort of su similar suggestion. So th my, my thought is that actually where there's been privatisation and the neoliberal pushes of in the UK and the US have that ad had that effect and led to privatisation, I think that that neoliberal agenda will push out more generally globally and so there'll be, in other states, there will be the privatisation of the military, so currently state-based. So I think the future of the private military industry is rosy, although that's not necessarily an ethically good thing. Well, Dr James Patterson, 